Chapter Eight of the Life and Adventures of Michael Armstrong, the Factory Boy. This is a LibriVox recording. Chapter Eight, a very innocent tete a tete, but in which Miss Martha Dowling comes to a wrong conclusion. An unfortunate embassy, an agreeable excursion, a philosophical disquisition, a visit to the factory. While these things were going on in my Lady Dowling's morning drawing room, the forgotten Martha forgotten at least by all but little michael employed herself in seeking such a basket as might answer the purpose of a viaticum between the object of her father's charity and the mother and brother of whom he had so fondly spoken having at length succeeded in her quest she returned to the dining-room and was almost as much disappointed at finding the object of her good-natured exertions flown as the poor child himself had been when obliged to quit the room to which this kind friend had promised to return but martha though not a person very highly favoured by circumstances was nevertheless better off than michael inasmuch as by keeping out of sight she could pretty generally contrive to remain where she chose and do what she liked these enviable privileges enabled her now to sit down at one of the large open windows of the dining-room and to draw from her unseemly sized pocket a volume of shakespeare with which she determined to beguile the time till the boy should return or till by some means or other she might be able to discover what had become of him when therefore impelled by the playful but very ineffectual impulse of sir matthew's shove michael once more entered the dining-parlour he had the satisfaction of being again greeted by the friendly eye and friendly voice which had already so greatly cheered him so here you are again my little man said martha repocketing her book and rising i thought you would hardly forget the basket see here it is and now you shall help me pack it the help thus asked for was afforded by the happy child's holding the basket in his hand as he followed her round the table while with a smile that spoke as much pleasure as his own she selected all sorts of good things to put into it there now i don't think we can put in any more michael so set off and carry it to your mother with eyes beaming rapture and little hands that trembled with delight michael closed the lid of the basket and proceeded towards the door but ere he had fully reached it he stopped short and addressing martha in a tone as fearless and confidential as if she had been his sister he said but what do you think about teddy mightn't i change into my old clothes again and just step into the factory for one minute teddy can't almost never eat the dinner as we takes to the factory and a bit of this would do him so much good may i upon my word michael i am rather puzzled what to say replied his friend as papa has ordered you to have these clothes he might not be pleased at your taking them off again and it would be a great pity to make him angry with you when he is so very good and kind wouldn't it michael hung his head and said nothing but why need you to change your clothes my dear boy i dare say teddy would be very proud to see you look so nice still michael answered not but began assiduously picking to pieces the handle of martha's delicate basket don't do that dear said martha approaching and taking the offending hand in hers but tell me what you are thinking about i am thinking said michael that if i walked into the midst of em this way and up to poor teddy in his dirty ragged clothes it would look and here he stopped without finishing the sentence it would look how as if you were proud perhaps said martha the child shook his head no not that teddy would not think that he replied what would he think then tell me all that is passing in your little head and then i shall be able to advise you why he'd think said michael and tears started as he spoke he'd think that he and i could never be right down brothers any more martha involuntarily kissed the little face that was turned up to hers but replied laughingly oh that's foolish michael do you think that a fine jacket could separate two little brothers that love each other i think i could love you quite as well in a shabby coat as in a fine one michael looked at her very earnestly for a minute or two and then said almost in a whisper is sir matthew dowling as owns our factory your father yes michael replied martha colouring from some painful feeling which the expression of the boy's speaking features had given rise to the child coloured too but said with good courage please ma'am i should love teddy just as well and teddy would love me only the others may be would mock at him and me too and i know teddy could not bear it then they would not be as good children as i think you are but tell me michael something about the mill papa has never let us see it yet 
and i believe it is only because mamma thinks it is a dirty place is it very dirty michael yes please ma'am and what makes it so my dear the cotton that goes into it looks as white as snow i never can get anybody to tell me anything about a mill but i think it must be very curious and i want to know michael what good such very little creatures as you can do there yet i have heard papa say that he pays a vast quantity of money to quite little children and that's the reason he says that the factories are such a blessing to the country you get wages don't you my little fellow yes ma'am i gets two shilling a week and teddy eighteen pence cause he's weaker that is not much to be sure but it's better than nothing isn't it yes ma'am do the children in general like it like what ma'am working in the factory my dear and getting money for their poor parents the children likes to have the wages replied michael but perhaps they do not like to do any work for them michael said martha laughing that's what papa says but it is not right my dear for little boys and girls to be always at play you know don't you think michael that it is proper for poor people's children to do something to help themselves if they can yes ma'am said michael but in so low a tone that it was as much as martha could do to hear it and so melancholy a look accompanied the words that she could not help thinking there was a great deal of truth in what she had constantly heard repeated by most of her father's friends and neighbours as well as himself namely that the factory children were a race of very idle ungrateful little creatures spoilt by the high wages and indulgence they received and quite unconscious of the inestimable advantages they possessed over all the other children in the british dominions but nevertheless though this disagreeable conviction pressed very painfully upon her martha could not help feeling very kindly disposed towards little michael and upon his presently saying shall i go to mother and teddy if you please ma'am she almost forgot all the naughtiness she attributed to him and his fraternity and only remembering the disadvantage that any disobedience to her father's wishes might bring upon him said wait one moment michael and i will find papa and ask if you may change your dress in order to visit your brother in the factory so saying she left the room and having ascertained that the visitors were gone ventured to seek her father in the drawing-room where she found him in deep consultation with dr crockley his two eldest daughters and his son as to the possibility of converting the schoolroom into a theatre all being of the opinion that the great drawing-room must be reserved for the ball and the dining-room for the supper which it was agreed on all sides must follow the representation may i speak to you papa said martha timidly on perceiving that the whole party was exceedingly earnest upon some theme or other oh goodness martha don't come to plague us now exclaimed arabella it is very odd but martha always does come in the way of everything said harriet i wish you were married or buried child cried the lively augustus for you make a monstrous bad hand at playing the young lady of fashion upon my life you grow fatter every day doesn't she doctor i wish you would dose her a little that miss martha is a little opaque i will not deny replied dr crockley familiarly coming behind her and measuring the expanse of her waist with his two hands may i speak to you papa repeated the patient martha quietly retreating from the jocose hands of dr crockley but apparently quite insensible to all the other attacks what do you want to say martha demanded sir matthew thus much encouraged she drew near and whispered to him the little boy that you have taken in papa wants to know if he may put on his old clothes again and go to speak to his brother in the factory do you hear this doctor exclaimed sir matthew the boy wants to go back to the factory again isn't that an answer to all the trash that people have been trying to get up about their being overworked it is just like em that's the very model of a factory child do what you will you can never content em the chap wants to get back to the factory said dr crockley addressing himself to martha with an accent that indicated surprise that's curious enough anyhow no sir i do not believe he wants to do any more than speak to his brother who is at work there he wanted to take him something that was left at luncheon papa and to show off his own good living to the factory that's it i suspect doctor one can understand that and what do you say to it i should have no objection i think what's your opinion only i don't see the fun of his going in his old rags if he went as you saw him just now it would make some fun wouldn't it capital by jove replied the doctor how quick you are sir matthew 
you sees everything in a moment what do you say to our going along with him mightn't we catch a hint or two as to how things were going on if i'm quick crockley upon my soul you are not slow replied the knight you've got your horse here of course the doctor nodded assent then i will order mine and we'll ride down to the mill together so get along martha and tell the boy that i will take him to the factory with me but that he is not to change his clothes martha felt quite aware that she had not executed her commission successfully but there was no help for it and therefore with the best grace she could she told her little client the result of it the whole aspect of the boy changed as he heard it and as if instinctively he placed the precious basket that till now he had continued to hold firmly in his hand upon a table near him but take your basket michael said the kind-hearted martha in a voice that was intended to cheer him i am sure papa won't be angry at your doing that for i told him about it no please ma'am i'd rather not said michael well then go into the hall by that door and wait till sir matthew comes through perhaps he will speak to you about it and at any rate you had better carry it as far as that the child obeyed her and taking up again the treasure he no longer valued passed out into the hall but before sir matthew and his friend entered it michael had put the worthless basket out of sight hardly had he done so when he heard the coarse laugh of sir matthew and the respondent titter of the doctor approaching the little fellow started and jumped aside in order to place himself out of their way but the knight striding to the place where he stood seized him by the shoulder with his hand while with a vigorous action of his enormous foot he sent him forward towards the house door this feat which was performed with considerable dexterity met its reward in the shout of laughter with which dr crockley welcomed it by jove sir matthew he exclaimed as soon as he had recovered his breath there is nothing like you on the face of god's earth it is a confounded monopoly though let me tell you no man has a right to be the deepest reasoner the best jester and the most finished man of taste of his age it's monstrous sir knight and a conspiracy against you would be a very honest plot and as he spoke he held his sides as if still suffering from the effects of his excessive merriment a servant who followed the facetious pair now opened the door and on the broad esplanade of gravel before it a couple of grooms were holding the gentlemen's horses as soon as they were seated in their saddles with a mounted attendant behind them the great manufacturer turned round his head to seek the object of his charity michael stood doubting and trembling on the lowest step of the portico while a faint hope fluttered at his heart that the grand gentleman would ride away and forget him but it was quickly chased by the voice of sir matthew who bringing his horse's head so close upon the child as to touch him while he seemed almost to shrink into the pillar by which he stood to escape it said in a voice the jeering tone of which again almost convulsed dr crockley with laughter pray young gentleman may you happen to know the way to brookford factory the boy looked out upon the wide spreading park and though despite the carefully chosen position of the mansion many towering grim-looking chimney-cones were seen to rise amidst their own lurid smoke in the distance for in that direction lay the town of ashley he could catch no glimpse of the hated walls that for years past had formed his daily prison-house he therefore answered but not very audibly no sir if you please speak up my hero vociferated sir matthew advancing upon him yes or no no replied the boy distinctly then be pleased to have the kindness to do me the favour of following my horse and i will have the honour of showing you the way so saying sir matthew gave a merry look of intelligence to his friend and they set off together at a brisk trot michael for a piecer was a tall child for his age note piecer the children whose duty it is to walk backwards and forwards before the reels on which the cotton silk or worsted is wound for the purpose of joining the threads when they break are called piecers or pieceners and though his limbs were wretchedly thin and attenuated they had sufficient elasticity to enable him for some time to keep at no great distance though it was a constantly increasing one from the two gentlemen but by degrees his breath and strength failed and perforce his speed relaxed into a panting shuffling walk sir matthew who from time to time turned round a laughing face to look at him now reined up his horse and awaited his approach upon which michael redoubled his efforts and in a few minutes stood beside his benefactor step on young gentleman step a little quicker if you please or perhaps i may find a way to mend your pace 
i am not very fond of such lazy company and suiting his action to his words he gave the quivering child several sharp cuts across the shoulders with his riding-whip he trots out in style now doesn't he doctor said sir matthew gaily making his well-bitted horse cross and recross the road in such a manner that at each manoeuvre the goaded child fancied himself already trampled beneath his feet don't you think i should make a good dancing master crockley capital by jove egad the youngster has learned some vastly pretty steps already by the way sir matthew continued the philosophical physician when one watches that pale-faced young scamp making such active caprioles for no reason on the earth but because he hears your pretty gentle jennet snuffing at his shoulder when one watches that it is impossible not to see that nothing in god's world but sheer wilful laziness makes those obstinate little brutes at the factory pretend to totter and stumble and faint and the devil knows what when all their work is to walk backwards and forwards as leisurely as if they were parading for pleasure nothing shall ever make me believe but that all the grunting and grumbling we hear about overworked children proceeds from a regular conspiracy among the worst of the parents and upon my soul if you yield to it you'll soon have to look after the wheels yourself get on with ye to the lodge there you lazy cur said the knight addressing his panting protege and wait till we come up then reining up his horse sir matthew drew close to his highly valued intellectual companion and falling into a gentle footpace continued the scientific discussion with deep interest and a wonderful clearness of perception it is quite curious to me crockley he said to observe how common sense and observation will often make a man of tolerable ability hit upon the very same facts and come exactly to the very same conclusions as the man of science who has passed his whole life in study what you have mentioned now is precisely what has occurred to me over and over again a thousand times i am sure at the very least since i have been working brookford factory for just watch my dear crockley any little village vagabond that you may chance to see as you ride about the country just watch him at play and tell me where you'll find a grown man that can keep moving as he does nowhere sir matthew nowhere upon the face of the earth and it stands to reason in spite of all that the confounded canters can say to the contrary that nature made them so on purpose why what's steam let them answer me that is steam man's making isn't it sent by providence and what for i should like to know isn't it for the good of mankind and how is it that good to be had if the nimbleness of children is not brought to bear upon it it is neither more nor less than a most shocking impiety sir matthew and upon my soul if i were you i would build a meeting-house of my own and hire a preacher too at a pretty good salary to preach against it but no church of england parson remember because if they don't preach the doctrine you like you would have no power to turn em out you're right crockley that's a devilish good idea i'll turn it over in my head and i shall like to hear some more of your notions about it by the way crockley you must not think of going home to dinner to-day we'll have a cool bottle of claret and talk the matter comfortably over and there's another thing too i want to speak to you about there's a devilish deal of talk about the health of the factory brats and i have a notion of appointing a regular medical practitioner upon my establishment who might always be ready if called upon to answer any questions that might be asked now i hear you are a man crockley capable of obliging a friend that deserves it and if it's agreeable to you instead of looking in now and then to give us an opinion as you do now you shall have a regular appointment with a couple of hundred a year just to look after the health of the children i should like such an arrangement exceedingly well sir matthew you know my love of science and this would give me a capital opportunity for speculating upon different constitutions egad sir matthew i should like to write a book upon the subject i think a monstrous deal of good might be done that way no doubt about it crockley a clever fellow like you may throw an amazing deal of light upon a subject that is really becoming exceedingly important especially when one recollects that the national wealth and prosperity depends upon it altogether you must come and dine with me often crockley without any ceremony and we may be able to hit out many a good thing over the bottle the two gentlemen now reached the lodge gates where little michael stood waiting for them 
and as the high road soon turned in such a direction as to make brookford factory visible he was ordered to run on and wait at the gates without minding them they accordingly proceeded in their conversation without interruption and in the course of it some very excellent hints were thrown out relative to the manufacturing interests in general and to that of brookford factory in particular having reached the gates of what was generally termed his magnificent establishment and waited till the stylish groom in attendance upon him came up sir matthew and his estimable friend left their horses with him and entered the court which protected by a very lofty wall surrounded the buildings on all sides those persons who have once in their lives seen a large cotton factory need no description of it for it has features which once looked upon can never be forgotten but for the information of those who have not a slight sketch of sir matthew dowling's establishment shall be given it consisted of very extensive buildings constructed in the centre of the enclosed court and forming three sides of a vast square the fourth being open on the side fronting the principal gates of entrance when it is stated that the edifice consisted of six stories and that each side of it presented six lines of windows containing forty windows in each line some idea of its magnitude may be conceived michael was already at the gates and on the approach of sir matthew rang the bell a ceremony necessary to obtain admittance both for masters and labourers no means of entrance or exit being ever left unsecured for a single instant the summons was answered by a lame boy stationed within to perform the office of porter he bent low before the great man and low too before his jeering friend though the jocose visits of the latter to the factory were dreaded as much as the lash itself neither the one nor the other seemed to see him but passed on then followed poor little michael hating most cordially the bravery of the attire which made him expect to meet the ridicule rather than the sympathy of his late companions on seeing a young stranger the lame porter looked up but from him at least michael had nothing to fear for the boy's languid eye surveyed his altered person without the slightest suspicion of ever having seen it before sir matthew like most others of his craft was not in the habit of indulging his family by exhibiting them to the secret arcana of that hideous mystery by which the delicate forms of young children are made to mix and mingle with the machinery from whence flows the manufacturer's wealth this divine portion of the vast engine being considered however as a very inferior though necessary part of it but although they had never honoured the premises with a visit it was of course well known to all that sir matthew dowling was the father of a numerous progeny and michael passed on amidst such blessings as human nature under such circumstances was likely to bestow on one of them the party entered the building whence as all know who have done the like every sight every sound every scent that kind nature has fitted to the organs of her children so as to render the mere unfettered use of them a delight are banished for ever and for ever the ceaseless whirring of a million hissing wheels seizes on the tortured ear and while threatening to destroy the delicate sense seems bent on proving first with a sort of mocking mercy of how much suffering it can be the cause the sense that reek around from oil tainted water and human filth with that last worst nausea arising from the hot refuse of atmospheric air left by some hundred pairs of labouring lungs render the act of breathing a process of difficulty disgust and pain all this is terrible but what the eye brings home to the heart of those who look round upon the horrid earthly hell is enough to make it all forgotten for who can think of villainous smells or heed the suffering of the ear-racking sounds while they look upon hundreds of helpless children divested of every trace of health of joyousness and even of youth assuredly there is no exaggeration in this for except only in their diminutive size these suffering infants have no trace of it lean and distorted limbs sallow and sunken cheeks dim hollow eyes that speak unrest and most unnatural carefulness give to each tiny trembling unelastic form a look of hideous premature old age but in the room they entered the dirty ragged miserable crew were all in active performance of their various tasks the overlookers strap in hand on the alert the whirling spindles urging the little slaves who waited on them to movements as unceasing as their own 
and the whole monstrous chamber redolent of all the various impurities that by the perfection of our manufacturing system are converted into gales of araby for the rich after passing in the shape of certain poison through the lungs of the poor so sir matthew proudly looked about him and approved and though it was athwart that species of haughty frown in which such dignity as is apt to clothe itself dr crockley failed not to perceive that his friend and patron was in good humour and likely to be pleased by any light and lively jestings in which he might indulge perceiving therefore that little michael passed on with downcast eyes unrecognised by any he wrote upon a slip of paper for he knew his voice could not be heard make the boy take that bare-legged scavenger wench round the neck and give her a kiss while she is next lying down and let us see them sprawling together sir matthew read the scroll and grinned applause the miserable creature to whom the facetious doctor pointed was a little girl about seven years old whose office as scavenger was to collect incessantly from the machinery and from the floor the flying fragments of cotton that might impede the work in the performance of this duty the child was obliged from time to time to stretch itself with sudden quickness on the ground while the hissing machinery passed over her and when this is skilfully done and the head body and outstretched limbs carefully glued to the floor the steady moving but threatening mass may pass and repass over the dizzy head and trembling body without touching it but accidents frequently occur and many are the flaxen locks rudely torn from infant heads in the process it was a sort of vague hope that something comical of this kind might occur which induced dr crockley to propose this frolic to his friend and probably the same idea suggested itself to sir matthew likewise i say master michael vociferated the knight in a scream which successfully struggled with the din show your old acquaintance that pride has not got the upper hand of you in your fine clothes take scavenger number three there round the neck now 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 as she lies sprawling and let us see you give her a hearty kiss the stern and steady machinery moved onward passing over the body of the little girl who owed her safety to the miserable leanness of her shrunken frame but michael moved not are you deaf you little vermin roared sir matthew now she's down again do what i bid you or by the living god you shall smart for it still michael did not stir neither did he speak or if he did his young voice was wholly inaudible and the anger of sir matthew was demonstrated by a clenched fist and threatening brow where the devil is parsons he demanded in accents that poor michael both heard and understood fine as he is the strap will do him good in saying this the great man turned to reconnoitre the space he had traversed and by which his confidential servant must approach and found that he was already within a good yard of him that's good i want you parsons do you see this little rebel here that i have dressed and treated like one of my own children what do you think of his refusing to kiss miss number three scavenger when i bid him the devil he does said the manager grinning we must see if we can't mend that mind your hits masterpieceer and salute the young lady when the mules go back like a gentleman sir matthew perceived that his favourite agent feared to enforce his first brutal command and was forced therefore to content himself with seeing the oiled and grimy face of the filthy little girl in contact with that of the now clean and delicate-looking michael but he felt he had been foiled and cast a glance upon his protege which seemed to promise that he would not forget it having made known to the superintendent that it was his pleasure to enter the room where the brother of michael was at work mr parsons led the way to the fifth floor of the building sir matthew however ordering the door of each chamber as he passed up to be opened for him that he might look in upon his stifling slaves and satisfy himself that neither wheels nor sinews were loitering in unthrifty repose the air that issued from each was nauseous and on entering the room at the farther end of which edward armstrong was employed dr crockley secretly resolved that when making the final arrangements for his promised appointment it should be specified that he should never enter the working portion of the establishment for though by no means a particularly scientific practitioner the little doctor knew quite enough of the business he followed to be aware that in his own case at least the air which filled it could not be breathed with impunity now then sir said sir matthew addressing himself to michael while parsons opened the door on the fifth floor and announced that this was the room that contained edward 
now sir walk on and find your brother and if your pride does not stand in your way let him be made to understand all the extraordinary kindness i have shown you take care that you let him and all his companions know that i have adopted you as one of my own family and that henceforward they will always see you dressed as well as you are at present all that michael clearly understood from this harangue was that he had permission to go forward and speak to his brother and though not venturing quite to run he moved onward at a pace that speedily brought him within sight of edward the little fellow who despite his gay disguise immediately recognized him uttered a cry of joy love conquered fear and dropping the reel he had just taken between his fingers he rushed from the place he occupied before the mules and the next moment was fondly clasped in his brother's arms every labourer in the factory within sight of the spot where this meeting took place forgot all standing orders in their astonishment and stood with gaping mouths and eyes fixed upon the astounding spectacle sir matthew too forgot for an instant that every movement made within that crowded chamber not having for its object the transmutation of human life into gold was a positive loss to him for the display of his extraordinary benevolence was he conceived of high importance and he looked round with great contentment on the multitude of wondering faces which he saw peering over the machinery in all directions to gaze on the sight he had prepared for them this will be talked of or the devil is in it thought he i should like to know who would dare to mention night-work and hard usage now a capital scheme this as ever was hit upon and from the gazers he now turned his eyes upon the object that fixed their attention when to his inconceivable astonishment and rage he perceived that the two boys who still stood locked in each other's arms were both weeping bitterly not loud but deep were the curses that he breathed against the unfortunate object of his affected bounty and faithfully did he pledge a promise to his own heart that he should pay for the vexation he thus occasioned him but for the present he condescended to veil the feeling by a smile more bland than any one ever before witnessed from him within those walls and striding forwards to the sobbing children he laid a hand on the shoulder of each while he said in a voice that seemed endowed by nature with an especial power of competing with the thunder of a cotton-mill come come my dears i know you are crying for joy but you must not go on so for it will look as if little michael was ungrateful for all i have done for him have you told your brother dear how i ordered you to take some nice things home to your mother that will make him look up i'll answer for it there now i'll leave you here that you may tell all your friends that you have been made a gentleman of on account of your good behaviour and because you was faithful to your master let them have ten minutes parsons with the mule standing still that they may all hear the story sir matthew then turned about and hastened out of the factory followed by dr crockley and as they slowly rode homewards by some roundabout lanes that were shaded from the sun they discussed high thoughts such as lycurgus loved when he bade flog the little spartans and ere they reached the luxurious abode of the night had between them sketched such a scheme of political moral and religious defence for the factory system in all its branches and in all its bearings that the doctor as he descended from his horse snapped his fingers triumphantly exclaiming a fig for them all sir matthew if they mine egad will countermine and we start with a pretty tolerable advantage you are a man of science sir matthew dowling and i need not tell you that a powerful movement once in action is devilish hard to stop the vis inertia will work for us my friend not to mention that when the animals find out their only alternative is labour or starvation labour such and so much as you and your bounty will be pleased to bestow they will all grow as patient as so many sucking doves these words were spoken as they slowly mounted together the steps of the stately portico sir matthew as a reply shook his friend cordially by the hand and leading the way to the cool and lofty library ordered iced water and claret to wash away the effect of their half-hour's visit to the factory End of chapter eight chapter nine of the life and adventures of michael armstrong the factory boy this is a librivox recording chapter nine some particulars respecting miss brotherton a demonstration of neighbourly friendship and anxiety the wilfulness of an heiress a gleam of light caught in the darkness 
the mansion of miss brotherton at the distance of three miles from the town of ashleigh though less splendid in external appearance than that of sir matthew dowling was quite as elaborately elegant in its interior and moreover incomparably superior to it in every point in which taste was concerned to this superb home we must now follow the young heiress as circumstances will hereafter frequently blend her name with that of michael armstrong the position of mary brotherton was a very singular one and in many respects far from being fortunate at the age of twenty-one years and eight months she found herself by the death of her mother in the uncontrolled possession of two hundred thousand pounds her father dead some six or seven years before had been a manufacturer of the old apprentice system school and his fortune made long before the humane bill of sir robert peel the elder had in some degree weakened the chains which bound thousands of friendless orphans to unmeasured and unmitigated drudgery note it was not till after the first number of this work was printed that the author learnt that the name of brotherton existed among the capitalists at lancashire but when in that county she heard it mentioned with great esteem but of all these circumstances his daughter was totally and altogether ignorant educated from a very early age at a fashionable london boarding-school she knew nothing concerning the neighbourhood of her home but that its hills and valleys were deformed by tall chimneys and dirty smoke and that none of the young ladies who paid her visits during the holidays were at all like her schoolfellows in london of course the little lady soon learned to know that she was a person of great consequence and at the age of fourteen had most completely acquired all the airs and graces of a spoiled child but the death of her father was a great advantage to her as his only child and the only heir of his immense wealth he rather worshipped than loved her and the attentions he paid her seemed more like acts of homage than of affection had she not given herself airs he would have been miserable and had it been possible that any act of hers could bring upon her a reprimand it would have been something indicating her belief that she was formed of the same sort of materials as the wretches who toiled for him fortunately however she was fond of her mother who being a great invalid lived quietly in the midst of her splendour and the holidays of her daughter were thus passed quietly too which saved her from much early adulation she had remained at school till nearly eighteen and from that time to the period of her mother's death which happened about fifteen months before the opening of this narrative she had led a life of great retirement dividing her time between the attendants in her sick mother's chamber galloping about the country on horseback and reading every book she could get hold of good bad and indifferent on first finding herself alone in her own great house the poor girl wept bitterly her mother's increasing sufferings had long made her release from them an event to be ardently desired by the only being who loved her but when at last it came and she had herself to think of and nobody else there was something almost terrible in her utter loneliness she was personally acquainted with very few in the neighbourhood and felt no affection for any of them of relations to the best of her knowledge and belief she possessed not one in the world and with all her advantages for she had many being young pretty talented and rich she would gladly have changed places during the first weeks of her dismal mourning with any girl of her own age who had father mother brother and sisters to love and be loved by mrs gabberly was the nearest neighbour she had on one side and lady clarissa shrimpton on the other and both these ladies had occasionally been admitted to see her mother till within a few days of her death when therefore this long expected event at length took place they both thought themselves privileged to assume the freedom of intimate friends and penetrate to the lone boudoir of the mournful heiress fortunate for her it was that they did so for though neither of them possessed any single quality of sufficient value to win and wear the esteem or even the liking of an acute clear-sighted observer such as the half-spoiled heiress certainly was it was better to hear the sound of almost any human voice uttering words of kindness than to sit lonely and apart and hear none so that neither the twaddling larum of mrs gabberly nor the absurd affectation of lady clarissa were without their use it might however have been somewhat dangerous to the moral development of the young lady's character had she long continued to find her only relief from sorrow and solitude in the society of persons who could only amuse her by their absurdities almost the first time she exerted herself for the purpose of pursuing some of her ordinary occupations she drew forth her drawing-box and produced a caricature of lady clarissa reciting verses from the pen of mr norval 
and the first observations she committed to paper were the result of a tolerably accurate counting of the number of times mrs gabberly had uttered well now during her last visit at length the first dismal fortnight being over miss brotherton appeared at church and then the whole neighbourhood rushed in to express their sympathy till her very soul sickened under the cuckoo note of sorrowless lamentation nevertheless there was so much of real sadness in the spectacle of a young girl thus left utterly alone in the world that despite the golden light her wealth threw around her many among her herd of visitors might have felt more for her perhaps than she gave them credit for but unfortunately such persons are not those who make their griefs and clamour war most audibly so she knew nothing about it if it were so and thereby lost any advantage which her temper might have gained from emotions that soothe and soften instead of this she had to undergo what she felt to be a very severe persecution from the prodigiously active interest which mrs gabberly took in her and her concerns as some of the singularities of miss brotherton's character will eventually produce results of considerable importance to our hero it may not be amiss to recount the particulars of a scene which took place in her boudoir exactly three weeks after the death of her mother on the morning in question mrs gabberly had as usual made her way unannounced to the young lady's presence by dint of that assumption of extreme intimacy in her manner of inquiring for her which in this case as in the multitude of others succeeded in putting to the rout the protecting discretion of her servants well now dear child she exclaimed on entering how are you to-day upon my word mary you are too pale you know my dear the pallor as we call it is not natural to your complexion and therefore the symptom must be attended to have you any camphor in the house dear thank you mrs gabberly but i want nothing of the kind well now then i must think of something else not for me ma'am i shall not take any medicine whatever dear child how very odd that does seem to me we people of science mary are so used to turn to it upon all occasions that it almost looks like losing one's wits altogether to go on so and take nothing people of no science ma'am do not require it well now so much the worse for them but that was not the point i came to talk about do you know my dear i am perfectly miserable in my mind about you i can't sleep at nights for thinking about the impossibility of your living on all by your own self in this great palace of a house miss brotherton turned away her head and resting her elbow on the mass of cushions that were piled beside her on the sofa concealed her eyes with her hand while her neighbour proceeded to discuss her condition did you ever hear of such a thing in your whole life my dear no never that's quite certain it is quite out of the question and impossible and to speak out the whole truth at once it is not in any way decent something a little approaching to a start produced a slight movement in miss brotherton miss gabberly proceeded well now my dear i have been thinking that what you must do is to find out among your friends and acquaintance some respectable person in the situation of a gentlewoman to live with you somebody already known in the neighbourhood would be the most desirable because then you would not have the trouble of introducing her for of course it will be in no wise proper for so young a person as you are to visit about even in the country without a proper chaperone again the cushions were slightly moved but this time it was not a start but a shudder which caused it well now my dear mary resumed the friendly mrs gabberly what do you think about it it requires longer time than i have yet had before i can answer your question mrs gabberly replied the young lady well now that's very true and very discreet and sensible and god forbid my dear that i should make you do anything in a hurry only you must not forget that everybody will be on the lookout to observe what you do depend upon it that they won't wait to make their remarks that's all the heiress retained her meditative position but said nothing don't you think what i have said is true my dear mary bowed her head but without changing the position of the hand which concealed her face i wish you would look up at me thought mrs gabberly i might guess then perhaps if there was any chance for me it would be a comfort as well as a protection wouldn't it my dear to have a kind affectionate friend always near you mary bowed again well now i wish you would open your dear heart and speak out 
tell me don't you feel very lonesome when you sit down to dinner i have been long used to that mrs gabberly yes but then you had not got to think all the time as i am sure you must do now that there was nobody near you that there was nobody in the whole great house but your own self besides the servants that there was nobody to drink your health nobody to say won't you take a little bit more my dear nobody to say isn't this very nice nobody to give you a nod and a smile when you look up nobody to ask shall i peel an orange for you my dear or shall i mix your strawberries and cream my love now isn't this all dismal very dismal ma'am replied the young lady in a voice that showed plainly enough that the picture was not an indifferent one well now that's saying something and i can't help thinking dear mary i can't help saying that it has come into my head that if mrs gabberly cried miss brotherton starting suddenly up i must now beg you to leave me you have described my situation so forcibly that i feel more than ever the necessity of making some arrangement that may better it but i will not do this without reflection leave me now i thank you for your kind concern and when next you call upon me you shall find that what you have said has not been disregarded well now that's all right and i'll go directly shall it be to-morrow dear that i call again no ma'am if you please not till next saturday saturday why my dear this is only monday it is a great while for me to live in such suspense about you dearest no ma'am not very long saturday it must be if you please and i shall be happy if you will stay and dine here on that day thank you my dear i shall like that very very much indeed and then we can talk everything over my dear mary god bless you my love take care of yourself dearest till saturday and just let me say one word in your ear at parting remember that there is nobody in the whole wide world that loves you as much as i do miss brotherton submitted herself passively to the embrace which followed and when the door closed after her affectionate neighbour she stood as it seemed patiently while her sharp short retreating footsteps were heard along the spacious corridor and when they were heard no more she applied her hand to the bell but something made her pause ere she rang it and stepping to a window that opened upon a balcony filled with skilfully shaded exotics she peeped forth from among them till the active moving little figure of mrs gabberly trudging along the drive below became visible and then the heiress turned again to the bell-rope and pulled it vigorously tell nurse tremlett tell mrs tremlett to be so kind as to come to me immediately was the order given to the servant who answered it after the interval of a few minutes during which miss brotherton stood with her arm resting on the mantelpiece with a countenance and attitude of deep meditation the door opened again and a pale thin little old woman entered who had not her wrinkles and grey locks betrayed her might have passed for five-and-twenty so active and nicely moulded was her little person but despite her still clear and bright black eye her face showed that she could not honestly count less than twice that sum of years come in dear nurse said miss brotherton kindly come in and sit down by me the old woman obeyed this command without further ceremony and by her manner of doing it showed plainly that it was not an uncommon one what have you been about my child said she you don't look well i dare say not replied mary abruptly i have been bored and plagued nurse tremlett and now i am going to bore and plague you in order to comfort myself for all answer the chartered nurse put her arm around the young lady's neck and gave her a very long kiss nay it is very true mrs tremlett and no joke in it i do assure you i am going to make a terrible change in your manner of life my dear old woman i am going to make a state prisoner of you you may plague and puzzle your old nurse as much as you like my darling so you will but smile and look a little less dismal than you have done of late and what is it you are going to do to me miss mary i dare say it is nothing that i shall think very hard i don't know that mrs tremlett replied mrs brotherton very gravely mrs tremlett and mrs tremlett said the old woman looking earnestly at her what does that mean miss mary i don't like it i know you won't like it but you must bear that and a great deal more my dear old friend you must make up your mind to lead a new life altogether and i am very much afraid that you will not like the change 
oh goodness miss mary what is it you mean you are not going to send me away from you are you is that the worst thing i could do to vex you said the young lady very cordially returning the caress she had received you need not be afraid of that at any rate the misfortune i threaten is of a quite different kind well then i shan't mind it let it be what it will but i don't think it is anything very bad my dear for you look as if you were ready to laugh though you try to look grave and talk of a misfortune it will be no misfortune to me i assure you but quite the contrary i shall like it very much and that is the reason you see me ready to smile and if you will be a dear good woman and make no difficulties about it all will go well mrs gabberly has been here nurse tremlett and she tells me that i must immediately take some elderly lady into the house to sit with me and take care of me because as she says i am too young to live alone and that all the neighbourhood will be making remarks upon me well my dear and i dare say she says no more than the truth your great fortune and your prettiness and all that will certainly bring many and many an eye upon you my dear child and of course it won't do for you to go on without having some steady lady of a companion like to be living with you but i hate all ladies that would come to live as a companion like replied the young lady what should i do with a miss mogg trotting about after me to ask if i wanted my smelling bottle or my pug dog and that is not the worst that could happen to me either as sure as you are there nurse tremlett mrs gabberly has made up her mind to come and live here as my companion herself and you would not like that by your manner my dear i do think she is rather too bustling and busy for you you are such a reader that you would not like any one that was over talkative and fidgety about you but don't fret yourself for that dear you must make some civil sort of excuse to mrs gabberly you are clever enough to find one i dare say yes nurse tremlett i think i am i have found one already that's very right miss mary and what shall you say to her my dear i shall tell her that you are going to live with me as my companion nonsense dear that is the joke is it that you were looking so merry about mrs tremlett i am not jesting in any way replied miss brotherton very gravely and i entreat you to listen to my proposal as seriously as i make it i am friendless very friendless dear nurse and trust me with all my money i am greatly to be pitied why in addition to the misfortune of not having a relation in the world should i be doomed to the misery of hiring a stranger to pester me with her presence from morning to night it is a penance that i cannot and will not endure yet i know that all people will say that i ought not to sit up here alone to receive company and i do not wish to be spoken of as a person who either knows not or values not propriety but if you will do what i desire miss tremlett you may save me from this and from what i perhaps should unhappily consider as a greater misfortune still namely the being forced to pass my life with a person whose presence was a pain to me tears flowed down the cheeks of the heiress as she spoke and the devoted servant who sat beside her though absolutely confounded by the strange proposal could find no words to utter in opposition to it dear nurse you will not forsake me then said mary smiling through her tears there's a dear soul you will let me have my own way in everything about your dress you know and all that it will be worth anything in the world to see mrs gabberly when she first beholds you sitting up in state in the drawing-room from the moment the old woman had perceived that her beloved but wilful darling was not only serious but sorrowful and that too concerning no imaginary grief but from the contemplation of the truly melancholy isolation of her condition all disposition to resist her vanished and yet nurse tremlett was perfectly capable of perceiving all the inconveniences likely to arise on both sides from so strange a scheme but even while such thoughts silently took possession of her leaving perhaps some legible traces on her countenance her young mistress looked so kindly and so coaxingly in her face as if at once reading and deprecating all she had to say that she felt nothing was left for her but obedience do what you will with me my dear she said with a fond smile and a shake of the head but seemed to say i know you must have your own way mary and thus was conceived and established a mode of life for the pretty heiress which left her as completely uncontrolled as to all she did and all she said as if nurse tremlett still occupied her quarters in what was once called the nursery but had since become the favoured nurse's sitting-room 
mary's delight in dressing and drilling the old woman for her new duties was childish and excessive and most triumphant was the satisfaction with which she perceived that rich black silks and delicate white crape performed their office upon her nice little person so effectually as to give her quite as much the air of a gentlewoman as the majority of those who were likely to meet her so on the following saturday mrs gabberly found miss brotherton no longer the solitary occupant of her elegant boudoir but with a remarkably well-dressed elderly lady seated in the most luxurious of all the newly invented chairs which decorated the apartment with a small work-table before her while on the footstool at her feet sat the heiress looking a vast deal more happy than she had ever before seen her the mystification did not last long the eyes of mrs gabberly were of that happy fabric which enables the owner to retain for ever the memory of every face they have ever looked upon and it was with heightened colour and no very sweet expression of countenance that she exclaimed so you have taken your old nurse tremlett to sit with you my nurse no longer but my most kind friend mrs gabberly who has affectionately consented to forsake many of her former comforts in order to be useful to me you will perceive ma'am that your advice has not been lost upon me well now that is a strange whim miss brotherton but of course you are not serious in trying to make me believe that it is your intention to let nurse tremlett assist you in receiving your company if it be so i think it but fair to tell you at once as my experience is rather greater than yours that not one single soul among all our rich folks will care to visit you at all i don't wish to affront you nurse tremlett but you won't contradict what i say i am quite sure of that mrs tremlett showed herself an apt scholar for she bowed her head went on with her knitting and said nothing if she was silent however miss brotherton was not listen to me ma'am if you please for a few minutes while i explain to you my ideas on the subject and having done so i desire that it may never be alluded to again i am left mrs gabberly as i dare say you know exceedingly well in the possession of an ample fortune with unlimited power to spend it as i please now i do not please to spend any part of it in putting myself under circumstances that i should feel annoying to me for this reason i will not hire a gentlewoman in all human probability of much higher birth than myself to watch my caprices and endure my whims if any one now in existence really loves me it is mrs tremlett and i too most sincerely love her therefore i flatter myself that drawing tighter the tie that has long united us will occasion pain to neither if the obscure tradition i have heard respecting my grandfather be correct he received much kindness when travelling the country as an itinerant tinker from mrs tremlett's father then a flourishing farmer in yorkshire so you perceive mrs gabberly that i am really honoured by the association but if any one should fancy the contrary if any one should feel that the luxuries of my house and table the only attractions i know of by which i may hope to draw my neighbours round me if any should feel that the value of these are lessened by the presence of mrs tremlett they must give them up for the price i shall put upon my good dinners and fine balls will be the most courteous and kind politeness to that dear and valued friend and now that we have finally and for ever dismissed this subject will you tell me if i may hope for the pleasure of your company at dinner to-day mrs gabberly from this period mrs tremlett never quitted mary brotherton excepting when the heiress accommodated lady clarissa shrimpton by the use of her carriage when they were both going to visit at the same mansion an arrangement which had often taken place during the late mrs brotherton's lifetime and which was of such very obvious mutual convenience that one was rarely invited without the other miss brotherton by degrees recovered her natural high spirits and though she not unfrequently felt the weight of great loneliness she was rapidly learning to enjoy her independence she read a great deal though nobody knew anything about it she dearly loved flowers and often assisted in their culture with her own hands despite her half-dozen gardeners she laid out whole miles of gravel walks in her own grounds with almost as much skill as went to form the cretan labyrinth in order that she might walk and walk and walk without passing her own lodge gates and so running the risk of being called imprudent she still indulged herself and with no sparing license in caricaturing her neighbours and if all the truth must be told derived no small portion of amusement from the variety of modes she adopted to assure the almost innumerable pretenders to her hand that it was not in her power to reward their valuable and flattering attachments 
such was mary brotherton's condition when she complied with lady clarissa shrimpton's request to drive over to dowling lodge the day after they had dined there upon this occasion as upon many previous ones the young lady for lack of other amusement occupied herself in selecting subjects for her merry pencil the best excuse to be offered for her offences in this line is that nobody but mrs tremlett ever saw her saucy productions so that assuredly they gave pain to no one and when the heart is empty and the head full much allowance must be made for such freaks and fancies while laying up stores of sketches for sir matthew lady clarissa and the poet her eyes suddenly became fixed upon the beautiful child who had been brought in for general examination like most other ready limmers of the human face miss brotherton had considerable skill in physiognomy and ere she had long gazed on the pretty nicely dressed little boy she felt persuaded that in spite of his gay habit de fête the child was ill at ease and under great discomfort it is difficult for persons residing at a distance and not to the manner born to conceive the extraordinary degree of ignorance in which the ladies of the great manufacturing families are brought up as to the real condition of the people employed in the concern from whence their wealth is derived there is however a homely proverb that may help to explain this you should never speak of a rope in the house of a man that was hanged and it is probably on the same principle that no one speaks of the factory in the house of the manufacturer be this as it may the fact is certain and mary brotherton like perhaps a hundred other rich young ladies of the same class grew up in total ignorance of the moans and the misery that lurked beneath the unsightly edifices which she just knew were called the factories but which were much too ugly in her picturesque eyes for her ever to look at them when she could help it little did the kind-tempered warm-hearted girl guess that for hours before she raised her healthy and elastic frame from the couch where it had luxuriously reposed through the night thousands of sickly suffering children were torn from their straw pallets to commence a long unvaried day of painful toil to fill the ever craving purses of which her own was one she knew that sir matthew dowling was considered as the richest man in the district richer even than her father had been and this was all she knew about him except that her own sharp observation had enabled her to perceive that he was ignorant vulgar and most ludicrously crammed with pretensions of all sorts after having looked into the face of little michael till she was perfectly convinced of his being exceedingly unhappy she next directed her attention to his benefactor as she heard him clamorously hailed on all sides and his countenance though smiling spoke a language she liked not it was evident to her that he was very keenly watching the boy and more than once she detected a look from sir matthew directed towards him which was instantly followed by an attempt on the child's part to look less miserable then followed all the nonsense about mr osmond norval and his promised drama which was to place upon the scene some prodigiously generous action of sir matthew dowling's towards this little boy mary brotherton did not believe a word of it and sick of the false and fulsome flattery that was bandied about between the knight the lady and the poet she made as we have seen somewhat hasty retreat on her road home she was more than usually silent being occupied in a meditation on the features of michael armstrong for some time she suffered her ridiculous ladyship to run on in a violent strain of panegyric upon sir matthew his talents and his generosity without offering any interruption but at length it struck her that fool as she was lady clarissa might be able to tell her what she wanted to know and therefore after answering indeed to some tirade about sir matthew's great qualities mary ventured to come across the torrent of her ladyship's eloquence by saying pray lady clarissa who is that little boy who my dear good gracious what an odd question is it possible you do not know that he is a poor little factory boy that sir matthew has most benevolently taken out of that sad way of life because he behaved so remarkably well about that cow you know my dear last night but why should you call it a sad way of life lady clarissa it is the way that all our poor people get their bread you know yes i suppose so but yet my dear you cannot but allow that it must be a very different way of life from what the little children lead whose parents from father to son for a dozen generations have worked on the mains of one family there can't be the same sort of family feeling and attachment you know however i have not the least doubt in the world that good sir matthew does his very best to make them comfortable is this boy to live in sir matthew's family i am not quite sure about that 
i believe it depends in a great degree upon the manner in which the little fellow behaves and so it ought you know my dear miss brotherton i rather think mr augustus was making himself too agreeable this morning for you to hear much of the story however the exquisite muse of our friend norval will set the transaction before all the world in a proper point of view and then you like everybody else will be able to form your own judgment respecting the conduct of sir matthew again mary sunk into a reverie concerning the respective countenances of sir matthew and the little factory boy but feeling quite sure that she should obtain none of the information she was burning with impatience to acquire from lady clarissa the remaining part of the drive was passed entirely in silence on her part excepting that when lady clarissa asked her if she did not intend to take a part in the theatrical performances about to be brought out at dowling lodge she replied no certainly lady clarissa shrimpton i do not End of chapter nine chapter ten of the life and adventures of michael armstrong the factory boy this is a librivox recording chapter ten part one more wilfulness on the part of the heiress private theatricals failure of a young performer and its consequences philosophical breakfast-table a morning's excursion no sooner did miss brotherton enter the room where she had left her old friend who was still tranquilly enjoying the perfumed air which visited her through the open window as she sat knitting before it then throwing her bonnet on one side she began to examine and cross-examine her as follows pray miss tremlett do you know anything about the factory people that work in all these great ugly buildings round about ashley mrs tremlett looked up at her for a moment before she replied and then said i know very little about them miss mary not much more than you do i believe i have just been thinking mrs tremlett how exceedingly wrong it is that i should be so profoundly ignorant on the subject wrong i don't see anything wrong my dear in your not knowing what you was never told i have been wrong in never wishing to be told but in truth i have never thought upon the subject and i have been very wrong in this that silly body lady clarissa said a few words to-day which quite unlike the usual effect of what she utters made a great impression upon me speaking of the children who work in these factories nurse tremlett she said theirs was a very different way of life from that of the children whose parents from father to son have worked for a dozen generations on the lands of the same family there could not be the same sort of family feeling and attachment she said but why should there not mrs tremlett these people work on i dare say from generation to generation and yet god help them poor souls from the hour of my birth to the present day i never heard anybody talk of attachment to them can you explain this difference to me i do not at all understand it but i am quite certain it cannot be right why do not we know something about our poor people as the people with landed estates do about theirs upon my word dear you have asked me a question not over and above easy to answer that is to say as to its being right but it is easy enough too in another way for i may say plain and straight without any fear of blundering that the thing is impossible what thing is impossible mrs tremlett why that the factory people should be noticed by the gentlefolks and treated in the same way as labourers that work the land you are too wise a woman mrs tremlett replied mary to assert so positively what you did not know to be true therefore i will take it for granted that it is impossible for people working in a factory to be treated in the same way as people working on a farm and now seeing god help me that i am most frightfully ignorant i must beg you to tell me what it is that causes this extraordinary dissimilarity between the different classes of the labouring poor my dear child it would hardly be decent to enter into all the reasons country folks that is the field labourers i mean are just as likely to be good and virtuous as their betters and so they are for everything that i have ever seen to the contrary but it is altogether a different thing with the factory people by what i can hear for of course i never went among them they are about the worst set of creatures that burden god's earth the men are vicious and the women desolate taking drams often and often when they ought to buy food and so horridly dirty and unthrifty that it is a common saying you may know a factory girl as far as you can see her so i leave you to judge miss mary 
whether such ladies as visit the cottages of the poor peasantry could have anything to say to such as these mary uttered no reply but sat for many minutes with eyes steadfastly fixed upon the carpet at length she raised them again to the face of her companion and said it is then among such people as these that children almost babies for such as the one i have just seen are often employed often my dear they are always employed with them and there's no particular hardship in that you know because these very men and women are the parents of the children and so they could not be separated anyhow what a dreadful class of human beings then must these factory people form is it not considered as a great misfortune mrs tremlett to the whole country why as to that my dear miss mary there's many will tell you that it is the finest thing in the world for the places where the great factories are established because they give employment to so many thousands of men women and even the very smallest children that can stand almost but you must not ask me my dear what i think about that for of course i am no fair judge at all i that spent my childhood in playing among the harebells raking up little cocks of hay for the hardest work i was put to and going to school to read write and sew like the child of decent christian parents in a civilized country i can hardly pass fair judgment on goings on so very different but i have heard my dear for i believe these things are talked of more in the servants halls than among the great manufacturers themselves especially when the ladies are by i have heard that a great many of the learned gentlemen in parliament say that the whole system is a blessing to the country then your account of it must be a very false one nurse tremlett said the young heiress severely i only speak after much that i have heard and a little that i have seen replied the old woman meekly however my dear dear miss brotherton she added if you will take an old servant's advice who loves you very dearly you will just make up your mind neither to talk nor to think any more upon the subject i am quite sure that it will give you no pleasure and it does not seem possible to me that you should do any good for you know my dear that you have nothing at all to do with any of the factories now any more than lady clarissa herself will you promise to take my advice my dear child and think no more about it on the contrary mrs tremlett replied the young lady i am perfectly determined that for some time to come i will think of nothing else mary brotherton kept her word during the whole time that the dowling lodge theatricals were in preparation while every other young heart in the neighbourhood male or female was eagerly anticipating the fete hers was fixed steadfast and immovable upon the mysterious subject that had seized upon it that man was born to labour that he was condemned to live by the sweat of his brow she knew from high authority and though under the social compacts which civilization has led to some portion of every race have found the means of performing the allotted task vicariously she felt not called upon to say that the arrangement was a bad one it was by no means difficult to conceive why it was so nor why of necessity it ever must be so she felt as all must do who reflect on the subject that if all distinctions were by some accident suddenly removed and the entire organization of society to begin de novo each man standing precisely on the same level as his neighbour the earth would not complete one revolution round the sun ere the quality would be violated strength will be the lord of imbecility and when nature made one man more active more intelligent or more powerful of frame than another she made the law in which originated inequality of condition that as time rolled on and mankind became bound together nation by nation substituting the conventional distinctions of civilized society for those derived from individual strength that when this happened occasional anomalies should appear in the arrangement seemed inevitable and of necessity to be endured that it was inevitable she conceived to be pretty nearly proved by the fact that no single authentic record makes mention of a nation in which hereditary distinction of some kind or other did not exist nor did it seem desirable that when the prowess the wit the wisdom or the toil of an individual had endowed him with wealth beyond his fellows he should be denied the dear privilege of endowing with all the children he loved instead of leaving it at his death to be struggled for and borne away by the most crafty or the most strong all this mary brotherton in her little wisdom of twenty-two years and half could without difficulty reason upon and understand but that among those whom fate or fortune had doomed to labour 
some should be cherished valued honoured by the masters who received and paid their industry while other some were doomed under the same compact of labour and payment to the scorn avoidance and contempt of those beings whose wealth and greatness proceeded from their toil was an enigma she could in no wise comprehend there must be something wrong argued the young girl as day by day she paced her gravel walks in solitary meditation there must be something deeply radically wrong in a system that leads to such results i may perhaps be silly enough to look with something approaching envy at the noble who traces his thirty descents unbroken from the venerable ancestor whose valour won in a hard-fought field the distinction he still bears on his armorial coat yet when i look round upon what the industry of my father the only one of his race whose name i ever heard when i contemplate what one man's industry can bequeath to his child i feel that there is no very substantial cause for complaining of hereditary inferiority of condition nay were i one of the peasants of whom the lady clarissa and nurse tremlett speak i can well enough believe that i might live and die contented with a life of healthful and respected toil but to exist in the condition of these outcast labourers to be thrust out as it were beyond the pale that surrounds and protects society to live like the wretch smitten by the witch's curse a man forbid must be hard to bear children young creatures still wearing the stamp of heaven fresh upon their brows are as it seems amongst these wretched ones i will find out why this is so or be worried to death by sir matthew dowling and his fellow great ones in the attempt towards the end of the month which preceded the grand display expected at dowling lodge mr osmond norval requested permission to submit his composition to miss brotherton's perusal a compliment she graciously consented to receive being desirous before she witnessed its performance of learning all she could respecting sir matthew's rather mysterious adoption of the factory boy and also of the poor child's equally mysterious sufferings under the benevolent process that was performing on him the little drama therefore which for obvious classical reasons the poet denominated a mask reached her hands enveloped in delicately scented paper but all she learned thereby was that mr norval had thought proper to entitle it gratitude and goodness or the romance of dowling lodge and to prelude it by a sonnet to be spoken by himself as prologue in which a modest allusion was made to milton's composition of comus for the use of the bridgewater family she had moreover the gratification of discovering in what order sir matthew lady clarissa the poet the governess most of the young dowlings and the little michael himself were to appear upon the scene and then she returned the young gentleman's m s with a very honest assurance that she doubted not the composition would most satisfactorily answer every purpose for which it was intended absurd as the whole business appeared to her she resolved to be present at the representation and having perceived in her study of the exits and entrances that no part was allotted to the homely martha she determined to place herself near her during the performance in the hope of eliciting the information she was so anxious to obtain on many occasions miss brotherton had remarked that this young lady either kept herself or was kept very much apart from the rest of the family which circumstance had been quite sufficient to propitiate her kindness for most cordially did mary brotherton dislike the whole dowling race but so deep-seated was the feeling of poor martha herself that nobody did or could wish to converse with her that the handshakings and smiles of the heiress had never suggested to her the idea that she might wish to be better acquainted this shyness had hitherto effectually kept them apart but no sooner did mary perceive that the neglected girl was the only one of the family above the age of a mere baby to whom no part in mr norval's drama was allotted than she resolved to profit by the circumstance and if possible get from her such a commentary upon the piece as might enable her to comprehend its plot and underplot accordingly when the great night of representation arrived miss brotherton reached the lodge somewhat before the hour named in the invitation and finding as she expected the room where the company were to be received unoccupied she desired one of the liveried attendants to send miss martha dowling's maid to her a female servant soon appeared are you miss martha's maid said the young lady oh dear no ma'am i am miss dowling's and miss harriet's maid miss martha never wants a lady's maid at all but i can take any message from you ma'am that you may please to send miss brotherton took one of her own cards and wrote upon it with a pencil dear miss martha if you are not going to act in the play will you have the kindness to come to me this note the soubrette as in duty bound first showed to her own young ladies 
good gracious how very odd what can miss brotherton have to say to martha martha of all the people in the world she is not ill crompton is she said miss arabella oh dear no ma'am at least she don't look so she seemed in a great hurry however for me to take the card well take it then cried miss harriet impatiently and make haste or i shall never get my ringlets done they take such a time do give her the card arabella what good is there in spelling it over a dozen times i dare say she only wants to cross-question her about augustus and what he's going to act so take the card crompton and run with it to martha as fast as you can crompton and the card found martha sitting still undressed in the obscure little room allotted to her in the children's wing she was deep in the pages of a new romance and being if possible more certain than usual that her presence would not be wanted had made up her mind to enjoy herself till the time arrived for the commencement of the play when it was her purpose to join the large party invited in their progress from the drawing-room to the theatre on receiving miss brotherton's card however she hastily resumed the business of her toilet for though the summons was as unintelligible to her as to her sisters she felt at least an equal desire that it should be civilly complied with it never took long to make poor martha as smart as she ever thought it necessary to be and in a very few minutes she joined miss brotherton in the drawing-room this is very kind of you miss martha i hope i have not hurried you said the heiress taking her hand so kindly that the shy girl could not but feel encouraged to speak to her with rather more confidence than usual why are you not going to take a part was the next question i take a part oh miss brotherton what should i make of acting said martha laughing and blushing in reply nay i think you are very right martha i assure you nothing could have persuaded me to have made the attempt but i thought that if you did not play you would perhaps have the kindness to take charge of me and let me sit by you for unless i have somebody to tell me what it all means i shall be horribly puzzled i will tell you everything i can replied martha good-humouredly but i don't think i understand much about it myself what sort of a little boy is it that your papa has been so kind to everybody is talking about it and lady clarissa says there is something quite sublime in what he is going to do for him but i suppose sir matthew must have remarked some qualities particularly amiable and good in the child or he would not distinguish him so remarkably from all the others of the same class you have heard the story of his saving lady clarissa shrimpton from the cow that was going to toss her have you not miss brotherton yes my dear i heard all that you know the morning i was here though by the by you were not in the room i remember but there must be something more in it than that do tell me all you know indeed i don't know anything more said martha what sort of a child is it a very nice little fellow indeed and i think if i had been papa i should have done the same thing myself really then you do think this child is something out of the common way i suppose pray tell me dear martha will you if you hear much about the people that work in the factories and the children in particular no indeed miss brotherton i know nothing in the world about them except that i sometimes hear papa say that they are all very idle and ungrateful replied martha i have been told that they are a very wretched set of people but perhaps they cannot help it martha returned mary i do not know how that can be miss brotherton everybody can help being idle and everybody can help being ungrateful i should think but it seems that they all live together and make one another worse and in that case the children are very much to be pitied for poor little things they cannot help themselves what makes you think this little boy is a nice child have you ever talked to him much yes a good deal but papa has been taking him about to a great many houses and besides he has been occupied very much in learning his part for duo who was teaching him said that he could hardly read at all so i have been trying to help him and he is very quick but i like him too because he appears so fond of his mother and brother he cares for nothing that can be given him unless he can take some of it to them and does your papa let him do so oh yes every day that is very kind then i suppose the little fellow is superlatively happy i don't know replied martha with a slight shake of the head it is very strange if he be not observed miss brotherton if he were kept from his mother i could easily understand that he might be very miserable notwithstanding the great good luck that has befallen him 
but if he is permitted to see her constantly i can't imagine what he can want more i don't know again replied martha the expected guests began now rapidly to assemble and refreshments were handed round previous to their being conducted to the room prepared for the evening's amusement don't forsake me dear martha whispered miss brotherton i am not very intimate with any of these ladies and gentlemen and i shall not enjoy the evening's amusement unless i am seated next to you martha felt a good deal surprised at the compliment but readily agreed to the proposal and in a few minutes lady dowling who was anything rather than pleased by the whole affair gave the assembled party to understand that the time fixed for their entering the theatre had arrived on tiptoe with curiosity and eager beyond measure to see what lady clarissa shrimpton mr osmond norval and all the dowlings would look like on stage the numerous company almost ran over one another in the vehement zeal with which they prepared to obey her of course no expense had been spared in fitting up the apartment allotted to the purpose in form and style as like as might be to a theatre and thanks to the taste and ingenuity of the little french governess the thing had been not only expensively but well done the space railed in for the orchestra very conveniently divided the company from the actors and when the curtain drew up the well-lighted stage exhibited such a carpeted draperied mirrored and flower-adorned arena as well-dressed amateur ladies and gentlemen delighted to appear in the very sight of the stage elicited a shout of applause and when mr osmond norval habited at all points according to the most accredited draped portraits of apollo came forth from behind the sky-blue silken hangings which formed the coulisses all the ladies began clapping till their little palms and fingers tingled with the unwonted exercise the young poet certainly looked very handsome and not the less so because he knew that besides miss brotherton's eyes which he was certain must be fixed upon him though he could not distinguish her in the obscure corner in which she had chosen to place herself beside martha those of miss arabella and miss harriet dowling both estimated at twenty thousand pounds were fixed upon him too not to mention the speaking orbs of lady clarissa shrimpton whose nobility he had little doubt might be one to smile upon and endow him with all the little earthly good she had could he make up his mind to believe that he could do no better all this flattered excited and inspired him most becomingly and as he stood with one silken leg slightly advanced and so firmly planted as to require only the toe of its fellow to support him from behind with a lyre suspended round his neck and a wreath of bay leaves mixing with the dark curls upon his brow at least two dozen young ladies in the manufacturing interest declared to their secret souls that they never could hope to see another like him having first recited the pretty sonnet before mentioned in which he modestly hinted at more points of resemblance than one between himself and milton he suddenly changed his hand and having as he expressed it to lady clarissa gleaned with the hand of a master he spoke the following lines which in the copies printed for private circulation were headed shakespearean prologue open your ears for which of you will stop the seat of hearing when loud rumour speaks i from the orient to the drooping west making the wind my post horse will unfold the act performed by virtuous dowling here oh for a muse of fire that should ascend the brightest heaven of description then should the noble dowling like himself assume the form of mercy and at his heels leashed in like hounds should famine pain and labour crouch all subdued etc etc the applause which followed this lasted so long that the performers began to fear there would not be enough time left for the piece but by degrees the tumult subsided apollo was permitted to retire and the business of the scene began there was something more nearly approaching a balance of power at dowling lodge than is often to be found in the domestic arrangements of gentlemen and their wives for though it may be a very doubtful point whether man or wife most frequently get the mastery it but rarely happens that the matter long remains unsettled at dowling lodge however there was a beautiful alternation of power which the measured movement of the engine in their factories first sending up one side and then the other might perhaps have suggested if matters came to a downright quarrel however sir matthew was sure to be the conqueror for her ladyship got frightened and gave in but when any differences of opinion arose on points of no great importance the lady's murmurings and mutterings were equally sure to be victorious and sir matthew let her have her way merely because like the organ-grinder 
he knew the wally of peace and quiet end of chapter ten part one chapter ten part two of the life and adventures of michael armstrong the factory boy this is a librivox recording chapter ten part two on the subject of the private theatricals there was most decidedly a difference of opinion between the heads of the dowling family and some rough skirmishing might have ensued had not mademoiselle bourgeois hinted to her good friend sir matthew that if they could introduce a scene or two where all the dear little children could be shown off lady dowling's objections would probably give way the experiment was made and answered completely on condition that gratitude and goodness should open and close with scenes in which the whole family should appear in fancy dresses and be grouped by the dancing-master in the most graceful attitudes he could invent lady dowling withdrew her opposition as soon therefore as apollo had retired from the front of the stage no less than sixteen male and female dowlings rushed forth from the silken hangings and formed themselves after some little confusion into a tableau declared on all sides to be of unrivalled beauty again bravos and clapping of hands announced the delight of the spectators and when this was calmed some very pompous verses gave notice that this display of youthful grace and beauty was on occasion of a rustic fete in which the dramatis personae were to amuse themselves al fresco then entered the lady clarissa but for some good reason or other it had been decided between the knight and herself that she should enter alone and from a most poetical scream of terror soon uttered by her ladyship it became evident that a dragon or a cow or some other dreadful animal had been pursuing her again and again with most picturesque effect she looked behind her towards the blue silk coulisse from whence she had issued till at length the feelings of the audience were worked up to a wonderful pitch by her ejaculating it comes it comes this was little michael's cue and as soon as the words were spoken he entered from the opposite side holding a ragged cap on high and dressed in all respects precisely as he had been on the memorable night of lady clarissa's vaccine adventure in dumb show the lady indicated the direction from whence the dreaded monster would approach and the most energetic and unsparing action of the limbs and persons secured the audience as well as her deliverer from any possible mistake on the subject michael too performed his part with great spirit exaggerating as he had been commanded by every possible means the manoeuvres necessary for turning the front of a cow to this scene too the audience gave loud applause and in the midst of it entered sir matthew who was of course greeted by bravos long drawn out till the ladies and gentlemen having nearly deafened one another ceased at last and listened to the beautiful explanation which followed first the company were made to comprehend that the danger was over for the well-taught michael turned about and manfully facing the audience pronounced distinctly the beast is gone then sir matthew after bowing respectfully to the lady said permit me madam to express my joy that you've been saved by this good little boy it was however uttered in an accent of such temperate and measured feeling that not even lady dowling saw anything very particular in it a precaution by the way which had been suggested by the gentlemen during the frequent rehearsals lady clarissa's acting then became animated indeed for the poet following her instructions had composed for her in smooth yet startling rhymes about thirty lines of the most fervent thanksgiving in which now laying one hand on the head of the ragged child now clasping both together in the eagerness of her address to sir matthew and now gracefully extending both arms towards the audience as if to make them sharers in her generous emotions she produced an effect more easily imagined than described the speech which followed from sir matthew was very noble and at once led the audience into all the secret purposes of his benevolent heart the by-play of michael during this scene had been prepared for by his benefactor with particular care but somehow or other the boy was not apt in catching the knight's idea for instead of the tender but joyous smile with which he had been instructed to look up into the face of his munificent patron his countenance expressed nothing but terror that little fellow does not look happy martha whispered miss brotherton oh no he looks very frightened replied martha but that is very natural is it not considering the novelty of his situation i don't know said the heiress 
the piece went on to exhibit the beautiful manner in which this adoption of a ragged factory boy into the bosom of the dowling family had been hailed by all of them as an especial grace from heaven on account of the opportunity it afforded for relieving the overflowing generosity of their hearts sir matthew while looking round upon his sixteen full-dressed offspring who were now again skilfully grouped upon the stage was made to exclaim with clasped hands and an almost sobbing excess of emotion the widow and the orphan are more dear to their young hearts than million pounds a year everybody was touched and again the applause was deafening then came a very striking scene indeed michael appeared superbly dressed and on each side of him was a middling-sized miss dowling holding lightly and gracefully each a little basket from under the covers of which peeped out grapes and peaches on the one side and something that had the semblance of a flask of wine on the other then spoke the fair-haired louisa dear little boy this basket's all your own tis to reward the courage you have shown and then miss charlotte so is this too my pretty little boy we hoped will give your poor old mother joy and when michael having received a basket in each hand appeared preparing to depart the two young ladies exclaimed together tis papa sends it who's so very kind how to do good is all he seeks to find upon this michael turned round again towards the audience and stood stock still it was quite evident that he had some speech to make which he had apparently forgotten but it was impossible for any child to look more completely distressed and at a loss at length it became pretty evident that in lieu of all other performance the poor boy was going to cry and some ingenious persons doubted whether it might not be in his part to do so but this idea was speedily removed by the very matter-of-fact pokes and nudges which the two young ladies bestowed upon him in addition to this it seemed as if the little fellow caught some stimulating sounds from the coulisse for he cast more than one furtive glance in that direction and at length with what was evidently a great effort he stammered out my mother's dear and so's my brother too but dearer still are your papa and you his charity's so great his heart so good he gives the naked clothes the hungry food and i for one will day and night in prayer ask blessings for him and his worth declare the two last lines were so completely choked by the tears which all his efforts could not suffice to restrain that they were perfectly unintelligible to the audience is all that vehemence of weeping a part of mr norval's composition inquired miss brotherton in a whisper to martha upon my word i don't know but i should think not was the reply martha said the heiress very earnestly that child is suffering from an agony of terror i should hope not said martha in a voice that somewhat faltered do you know anything about this boy pursued miss brotherton continuing her whispering do you know anything about the mother he talks of nothing whatever miss brotherton do you feel quite satisfied my dear that this romantic adventure has been or will be advantageous to him i think replied martha that one can hardly doubt his being better off here than in the poverty of his mother's dwelling you saw miss brotherton what a ragged condition the clothes were in which he had worn before decent clothes are a comfort my dear martha there can be no doubt of it but compared with the other circumstances which influence the happiness of life they are of no great importance of course i suppose that your father means to educate him do you know whether he can read his bible yet i know that he could not replied martha when he came here poor little wretch that is very terrible neglect somewhere what sort of person is the mother by michael's account replied martha smiling she is a very estimable person indeed but it certainly seems that she has not taken much pains with his education poor little fellow what a sad thing it is continued miss brotherton that we all of us know so little of the poor people employed in the factories i believe they are said to be exceedingly well paid but still i don't think it is quite right for the rich people in a neighbourhood to take no notice whatever of the poor i know it is not so in other places for i have heard my schoolfellows continually talk of their father's tenants and workpeople and of their schools and their clothing societies and all sorts of things 
and i have been trying to do a little good just at home with the families of some of the workpeople about the place but i have just now got my head strangely full of these factory folks i wish you could give me some information about them martha indeed my dear miss brotherton i know as little as you do i am told that they are very good for nothing that they receive enormous sums annually in wages and yet that they are never contented but for ever complaining just because they have to work to do for what they get and yet papa says that it is the very prettiest lightest work in the world and indeed i am afraid it is but too true for this little fellow though he is so interesting and intelligent that it is impossible to help liking him always speaks of the factory as if he hated it and if he does hate it martha why if you question him should he conceal it but i have never questioned him about that i should not think it right to do so only i remember his making me laugh just after he came here by saying something exceedingly naive about their all liking wages but not work now though i am not very deep in political economy it is impossible not to see that poor people must work for what they get don't you think so assuredly and rich people too i have no doubt that both your father and my father had to work very hard for the fortunes which have rewarded their industry in our class of life this is necessary but that does not settle the question that is working in my head at present and which to tell you the truth will not let me sleep by night nor amuse myself by day how comes it that all the people the only phrases i have heard upon the subject were very comprehensive how comes it martha dowling that all the people young and old who work in the factories are classed as ignorant and depraved my dear miss brotherton how is it possible that i should be able to answer you have you not heard the same statement martha oh yes very often i know mamma says that nothing in the world should induce her to take a girl who had worked in the factories into the house even in the very lowest situation oh i believe they are very bad very bad but good gracious why are they very bad what is the cause of this strange degradation of one peculiar class of human beings it surely cannot arise from the nature of their employment for if it did of course the clergy of the neighbourhood would interfere to stop it it is quite out of the question to suppose that in a christian country many hundreds nay thousands mrs tremlett tells me there are many thousands employed in the factories it is impossible to suppose is it not that any labour or occupation could be permitted which by its nature and of necessity tended to corrupt the morals of those employed in it there must be some other cause for their wickedness if wicked they are oh they are very wicked i am quite sure of that for i have heard it again and again ever since i was born and you know i have not been away like you miss brotherton always in london i have never lived anywhere but here and i never remember the time when i did not hear that the factory people were the very wickedest set of wretches in the world for a few minutes miss brotherton was silent and even seemed to have restored her attention to the silly business of the gaudy stage for her eyes were fixed in that direction but she presently gave evidence that wherever her eyes had been her thoughts had not wandered from the subject to which she appeared so earnestly to have devoted them for she said in the low slow even tone which denotes concentrated feeling if this be so miss martha dowling if thousands of human beings in a christian country are stigmatized as wicked because their destiny has placed them in a peculiar employment that employment ought to be swept for ever and for ever from the land though the wealth that flowed from it outweighed the treasures of mexico martha dowling started but said not a word in reply there was something in the manner of her neighbour which awed her true genuine deep feeling is always sublime be it manifested by such a young girl as mary brotherton or such an old king as lear but though martha was silent her companion suffered not the conversation to drop and presently resumed in a tone of less exultation do you think my dear that i could get hold of your little michael some day so that i might have a little conversation with him yes certainly miss brotherton replied martha i think papa would be quite pleased for he seems to like nothing better than seeing everybody take notice of him do you think your father loves the little boy martha i am sure he is very kind to him replied the conscious daughter a little piqued for it can be nothing but kindness that makes him take the child into the house and feed him and clothe him for nothing and of course martha he will get some instruction here 
oh he has begun to read the bible already replied the kind-hearted girl eagerly i have undertaken that business myself the poor little fellow seemed to suffer so when he was learning his part i never saw a child appear so heartily ashamed of anything one almost wonders at that too brought up as he must have been in the very lap of ignorance i should have thought after all i have heard that he would have been ashamed of nothing however i should like to talk to him at what hour do you give him his reading lesson martha when i catch him replied the young lady laughing you have no idea miss brotherton how much the little gentleman is engaged papa has taken him about with him in the carriage almost everywhere and such quantities of people have been to see him and does he seem greatly delighted with it all no i don't think he does he seems to me to care for nothing in the world but his mother and a little crippled brother that he talks of that does not look as if he were thoroughly confirmed in wickedness as yet observed the heiress no indeed it is his affectionate temper that has made me take to him for i do believe he is very idle and hates his work just as papa says they all do answered martha does he visit his mother every day he either goes or sends to her i believe papa makes a great point of something very nice being taken down to ashley every day for michael's sick mother to eat and the child always carries it himself when papa does not send him elsewhere and at what hour does he generally go always after luncheon don't you think the play must be almost come to an end martha said miss brotherton after looking again on the stage for a few minutes and yawning rather more conspicuously than politeness could warrant i should think it must replied martha catching and returning the yawn there was however a good deal to be done there was a figure dance to be performed and a trio to be played on the pianoforte harp and violoncello by the two eldest miss dowlings and their music-master this last was a very long business and the heiress who instead of having been instructed to endure annoyances patiently had been rather taught never to endure them at all got up in the middle of it and telling martha that her head ached too much to permit her remaining any longer made her way out of the room which she effected the more easily from having taken her station near a side door which led from the theatre in ordinary phrase the schoolroom into the private apartments of mademoiselle bourgeois martha dowling of course followed her and expressed much concern for her malady offering all the specifics usually suggested by one lady to another under such circumstances no thank you was the reply she received to all i only want to get away but it will not be very easy to do so this way replied martha unless you will condescend to go through the passage that leads from the offices never fear dear martha returned the self-willed young lady i will condescend to go through any passage that will lead to fresh air for indeed that place was too hot the room they first entered on passing through the door was one dedicated to the reception of globes slates guitars dumbbells dictionaries embroidering frames and sundry other miscellanies connected with an enlarged system of education beyond this was the bedchamber of mademoiselle which again led to an apartment opening upon that part of the schoolroom now occupied as a stage this room which was denominated mademoiselle bourgeois parlor was now converted into a general green room and dressing room for into this all exits from the stage were made while still in the bedroom miss brotherton and her more than half frightened companion heard voices speaking in no very pleasant accents from this theatrical retreat and the angry tones of sir matthew dowling himself were soon unmistakably audible let us go back pray let us go back said the greatly distressed martha in a whisper i am too ill my dear to bear that room again re-whispered miss brotherton let me sit down here a few minutes and i shall recover myself and then we can return and go out the other way with the rest of the company it was impossible to argue the point so poor martha submitted though cruelly distressed at the idea of her father's private violence of temper being listened to by one of those who had never seen dowling lodge or its inhabitants excepting in full dress this distress was by no means lessened when some very audible words made it evident that michael armstrong was the object of the angry feelings to which he was now giving vent as the best thing to be done under the circumstances she pointed to a sofa at the greatest distance from the imperfectly closed door from whence the sounds issued but miss brotherton had already dropped into a chair so near this door of communication 
that she not only heard but saw all that was passing in that part of the green room which sir matthew dowling occupied that this was the last place in which a gentlewoman would have been likely to place herself at such a moment is most certain but the capricious heiress was wont to exclaim on many occasions when observance and restraint were irksome to her i am not a gentlewoman and why should i torment myself by affecting to be one it was probably by some such reasoning that she now justified to herself the strong measure she was adopting in order to become acquainted with what was passing behind the scenes respecting michael armstrong circumstances were favourable to the object for sir matthew was in one of those towering fits of passion to which his family and dependents knew him to be subject though the majority of the world declared him to be an extremely good-natured man blackguard vermin devil's imp were among the first intelligible words which reached the heiress after she had seated herself and these were accompanied by cuffs so heavy on the head and shoulders of michael that it required a very powerful effort over herself to prevent her darting forward to seize the arm that gave them but this prudent effort was dictated and sustained by a stronger feeling than curiosity and she remained perfectly still to await what should follow dr crockley who though not among the corps of performers had been permitted to be useful behind the scenes in a variety of ways and among the rest had acted as prompter stood beside the trembling child and it was to his friendly ear that the irritated sir matthew addressed himself will you believe he did not do it on purpose will you believe crockley that there was anything to make him cry then had we not borne with all his beastly stupidity expressly for the purpose of keeping the little ungrateful monster in good humour hadn't i fed him and crammed him as you bid me with what was too good for him ever to have reached the smell of didn't i cosset his lazy beast of a mother with such niceties as the dirty beggar never heard of before and his crook-shanked rat of a brother too haven't they been all fed at my cost for more than a month past and then to see this black-hearted traitor come up upon the stage and cry before all the company as if his heart was breaking it's too bad to bear replied dr crockley and if he was to be flayed alive and salted it would not be half what he deserved wouldn't the best thing i could do be to send him back into the factory to-morrow morning doctor demanded sir matthew suddenly quitting his hold of the child and setting his square arms akimbo by the living god i am sick of the job i will be very good sir if you will said the boy and i won't go to sleep at the work at all and no more won't edward neither if you will but please to let me go back again you see how much he dreads the factory said sir matthew with a grim smile but nodding his head and winking his eye familiarly to the child we shall see my pretty dear if mr parsons can't contrive to do something more than just keep you awake he shall go back crockley upon my soul he shall it is the only way to prevent his driving me mad i loathe the very sight of him you must do as you like sir matthew replied his confidential friend but it will be the most d blank foolish thing you ever contrived in your life if you do i tell you the story is doing wonders everywhere and now because a stupid brat can't say his lesson perfect you are just going to spoil it all his lesson perfect confound the sly vagabond that was not the point crockley it was not the lesson that choked him how much will you bet me that if i get fifty lines written down abusing me and nothing else in em he won't learn them off as glib and perfect as any actor on the stage i know his black heart and he shall find out that mine is not made of pap before i have done with him that's all right and fair enough and i have nothing to say against it replied the friendly physician and let us talk it all over quietly together to-morrow morning but for to-night and here dr crockley taking his friend by the arm led him to the door which opened upon the stage from whence issued a tintamare of instruments sufficient to cover whatever he might wish to say not only from the ear of little michael but from all others the moment selected by the angry knight for relieving himself of the wrath which burned within him would have been a most favourable one but for the accidental vicinity of miss brotherton while the whole corps of performers excepting the manufacturer and the factory boy were grouped upon the stage in a style the most favourable for the display of their persons and dresses the trio above mentioned augmented by way of finale by tambourines and triangles 
went steadily on in a crescendo movement that ended in a clamour rendered perfect by the last peal of applause from the well-nigh worn-out audience so that their secret conference was not otherwise likely to be overheard at the moment after sir matthew had declared his intention of teaching michael to know what his heart was made of and just as he was himself led off by his friend crockley miss brotherton pressing her two hands strongly upon her breast involuntarily pronounced the word monster and then placing her hands before her eyes remained lost in no very pleasing reverie but hardly had her meditations lasted a moment ere they were chased by hearing the sound of some one falling near her and looking round she perceived poor martha stretched insensible upon the floor inexpressibly shocked at remembering which she did by no slow action of the mind the suffering to which her own unscrupulous curiosity had exposed the unfortunate girl she ran to her with eager haste and with much repentant tenderness raised her head and did all her small experience suggested towards restoring her the comfortable insensibility did not last long and martha who with restored animation immediately recovered her recollection and in whose composition no affection of any kind had part raised herself without assistance from the ground and silently placed herself upon a sofa dear excellent martha exclaimed miss brotherton with much true feeling fear not that i should ever repeat what i have so accidentally heard and let not your good and dutiful nature suffer thus because i have heard it we have all our faults martha and it is the duty of each to pray for the conversion of their own hearts first and then for the repentance of others and what prayers dear girl so likely to be heard as those of a good and dutiful child let us slip back to our places martha this clapping of hands announces as i take it the conclusion of the piece martha though wounded to the very soul uttered no word of deprecation or complaint but there was an unsophisticated simplicity of character about her which made her decline by a courtesy that had a little of the stiffness of ceremony in it the offered arm of mary and stepping forward she opened the door by which they had left the theatre till the heiress had passed through it and resumed her place End of chapter ten